think it's useful to recollect after taking the refuges and precepts what the Buddha described those foundations of our Buddhist identity and practice as. He describes the refuges as three streams of merit, of goodness, of happiness that constantly uh, fill one. And in the same sutta, he describes the five precepts as mahadana, great gifts, the gift of fearlessness to all those beings which one encounters as uh, a practitioner, as another being in the world, in that when you commit to not take life, to not steal, and so on, you align yourself with a path of harmlessness and the sense of safety that begins to surround you is almost palpable. There's stories of deer coming up to eat from Long Por Cha's hand. Uh, and I think there was even a king cobra that followed him on alms round once, or so the story goes. So rather than this, these precepts being taken as some uh, harsh admonition from a higher deity, we remember them as gifts that we give and to expand the five to the eight, to take on these additional restraints of refraining from high and luxurious sleeping places, from eating at the wrong time, afternoon, from entertainment and adornment. These are special gifts to ourselves, kind of the cherry on top, because they make practice easier. So Ajahn Kovilo and myself arrived uh, two days ago from Seattle with uh, 30 wonderful lay practitioners um, who are, or 28 I believe, who are sitting in the sala right now, pilgrims from Seattle, where about a year and a half ago, uh, with Long Anand's blessing, we went to see if there would be space and interest and faith enough to create a monastery. And uh, so far, our monastery is still very much in scare quotes. It's a monastery. People keep asking if they can visit, and we have a website, so you can visit that. But we do have a growing community, and we go on alms every weekday morning, and we gather every Saturday. and the interest in that heart, uh, that heart of the sasana that's embodied in the suttas, in this form of robes, there's faith ready for that. When Long Por Cha went to the U.S., he spoke to uh, several lay teachers there, and he said, you can't adjust the teaching too much to fit with what the proclivities of the culture here will want. You have to stab them in the heart with Dhamma. So a classic, uh, powerful teaching from Longpur, and one that is to the point in that what Thailand has preserved uh, is precious and a form of such pure and potent Dhamma. It resonates wherever it is dropped, whether it be in the rainy, uh, under the rainy skies of Seattle or outside of Rayong at Wat Mapchan. These teachings of the suttas, of the Kruba Ajans, that Longpur Cha, that Longpur Anan, um, that so many of our past have kept alive these 2,500 years are precious, potent, and powerful. And so now we have a chance to come here um, all 30 of the pilgrims, all those turning in on, tuning in on Zoom, to come back to the heart, one of the places where this teaching has been preserved most uh, purely. And 
thinking of pilgrimage, I think it's useful to frame. I think Ajahn Kovilo did a, an amazing job yesterday speaking to it. The skill of doubt, I believed he called it, or how to uh, skillfully doubt, and this being part of the essence of faith in a specifically Zen uh, sort of Cohen uh, phrasing. But one sutta I found, which is very helpful when thinking about the faith with which we approach pilgrimage, is the Mahanama Sutta. It's in the Anguttara Nikaya 11.12. And in it, the Buddha admonishes or encourages uh, a lay disciple named Mahanama to develop the five indriya faculties. And then he says, after this, Mahanama, you should develop six recollections. You should develop the recollection of the Tathagata, the Buddha. And when one, one's mind recollects the Tathagata, it is not overcome with hatred. It is not overcome with greed. It is not overcome with delusion. It heads straight based on the Tathagata. And in one whose mind heads straight, they gain a sense of the goal. They gain a sense of the Dhamma. They gain joy connected to the Dhamma. In one of joyful mind, rapture arises. One of rapturous mind, the body becomes tranquil. In one of tranquil body, concentration arises. And of such a one, they say, of those who dwell out of tune, this one dwells in tune. Of those who dwell with malice, this one dwells without malice. Having entered the stream of Dhamma, he develops the recollection of the Tathagata. And then he goes on and repeats those words, not just for the Tathagata, but for the second recollection, which is of the Dhamma, of the third recollection, which is the Sangha, of the fourth recollection, which is one's virtue, of the fifth recollection, which is one's generosity, and then the sixth recollection for all the sort of uh, modern skeptics out there and others is the devas, recollection of the devas. So that's a pretty well-rounded list of practice which we can take with us. And this sense of heading straight of alignment and solidity, which grounds us even in the face of jet lag, of 20 hour flights, of uh, heat we're not used to, of warnings of poisonous snakes, of trips to Bodh Gaya, um, of everything. Uh, this is helpful because it reminds us where our center is and that despite all that movement, we don't have to move. That sense of heading straight means our path, no matter how much it winds in the external world, is simple, direct towards the heart of the teaching, towards the Tathagata, towards the Dhamma, towards the Sangha. Longpur Sumedho, when he went on Tudong to Mount Kailash said, what changed for him was when he stopped feeling like he was moving through the world and instead recollected that he was simply standing still and the world was moving past him. This is how we walk Tudong. This is how we go on pilgrimage. You remain still in your heart. You bring to mind the mantra that Ajahn Kobilo recommended yesterday of, and the Kuba Ajans have of Budo, and you stay there and watch the world and all of its color and beauty pass, and you learn. There was someone uh, yes, or two days ago who was asking what Vipassana meant, insight. And she said, you know, I, I sort of don't want another technique. I have enough of those. What is Vipassana? And I like Ajahn Jayasaro's uh, description. He says, Samatha and Vipassana, tranquility and insight meditation, just means stop and look, stop and look. Vipassana is just us being still enough that we can watch something come into being and cease. And we learn what we can from that contact, but we don't chase it or get drunk on it 
or follow it with craving. And this is where insight arises, Vipassana. So in some sense, this is the first recollection that the Buddha recommended to Mahanama, Budo, or in the words of the Krupa Ajans, the knowing. This is our center still point where we remain unmoving in that sense of knowing of Budo as the whole world passes us. And in that we head straight. And it's also the foundation of our pilgrimage, this, the Buddha. And what's so useful to remember is that yes, many here in this room will get to go to the Bodhi tree in a few days, the place of the Buddha's enlightenment. But the Buddha said, he or one who sees the Dhamma sees me. One who sees me sees the Dhamma. And the Buddha spoke of four holy sites, the site of his birth, the site of his enlightenment, the site where he taught the first uh, sutta, the Dhamma Chakapavatana Sutta, and the site of his passing, Kushinagar, into Parinibbana. But he gave us four other pilgrimage sites, which we need to remember constantly. And that's the Four Noble Truths. That's the heart and the core of his teaching. So whether we are traveling to Budgaya or not, and e even if we are, these need to remain central through the pilgrimage. What's so significant about that is that the foundational for truth, the first, is to comprehend and turn towards our suffering, dukkha. And this is especially significant because if one has anticipated pilgrimage for a few months, saved up money, put aside time, and you have a lot of anticipation, and then you come, and maybe it is uh, perfect. You know, maybe it is really just a uh, stream of lovely days and amenable people. But maybe, maybe you're stuck in a van with someone who really annoys you, or maybe the heat is really getting to you. Maybe the jet lag is raw. Maybe you're constantly worried about what others in the group will think, will think of you. Maybe flying 20 hours in a plane didn't mean you left all your problems behind. And to understand that if what you're expecting is a perfect pilgrimage, you will most likely be disappointed. Whereas if you, what you're expecting is a moment of practice and deep practice that involves all four noble truths, including the first, that this will be perhaps at times a slow boil and you will learn. And yet, uh, one story that comes to mind is after Longpur Cha had built a new sala, he, uh, uh, a meditation hall. He gave a tour of it with some uh, lay disciples. And one pointed out some cracks in the hall's floor. And they said, oh, that's a pity. You know, it's already cracking. And Longpur Cha said, no cracks, no Buddhism. If there was no impermanence, there would be no Buddhism. So this is good to think with the imperfect thread of whatever comes into your day or your pilgrimage, no blank, no Buddhism. So put whatever you want into there. No mosquitoes, no Buddhism. No uh, overwhelming heat, no Buddhism. Uh, if there's someone who's kind of a bit difficult for you, no blank, no Buddhism. This is the heart of your practice. And if you turn towards it, this is the core motion of the heart in Buddhism turn towards the suffering you've been running from. And it's something we have to remind ourselves again and again. Long Portia Suchito says that any teaching that does not speak to the Four Noble Truths is not complete. So, and the difficulty is we always have to be pointed back to that first because it's so tempting to forget it. But orient yourself to that. Remember that whatever difficulty you encounter in this, is exactly where your greatest learning will be. 
And if you can make your heart broad and strong enough to turn towards that with compassion and clarity and insight as a moment of learning, of patience, of kindness, then this pilgrimage will be all that it can be. You will have started at the first pilgrimage site of the first noble truth where the Buddha was born. So the second teaching or the second recollection is of the Dhamma. And there's a few points that are worth bringing up here. One is that in Thailand, uh, or in, when the Buddha spoke about deep Dhamma, he spoke about Dhamma that is not, uh, that originates from direct experience, not uh, accessible by mere conjecture or logic. And what you'll hear in some of the teachings, especially that Long Por Nan is giving us and these other ajans, is body contemplation. And when we speak about American Tantra with uh, this sort of vague term we can use to denote uh, a beautiful mix of American Buddhism, but uh, one that uh, many in this room come from, but that doesn't like a whole lot to talk about uh, stripping people of their skins in your mind and seeing uh, their insides. That's not something you get on uh, a retreat in the US very often. And yet, when you hear uh, a practitioner of depth speak about seeing through the body as simply a biological machine, as a puppet, you can sense the glow of wisdom on the other side of those words. That is Dhamma that you cannot arrive at by conjecture. And it's one of the great missing pieces in Western Dhamma as it's taught today. So this is a flavor of Dhamma you'll encounter in Thailand from well-practiced monastics that is rare and precious. And if you read the Terigata or the Terigata, the verses of the elder monks and nuns, you see how many of their breakthroughs are predicated on breaking through the khanda of the body, rupa. We're so deluded about this, we don't even see it. And to get a chance to hear practitioners who have seen through it speak to it is a rare moment in our dharmic journeys. Take it to heart. The other point is, um, you know, in uh, the West, often the Dhamma is presented in quite uh, secular and careful terms. We don't want to alienate any, anyone, so we uh, don't really speak about certain aspects of the teaching too much. And then you come to Thailand, and there's a three, three story Naga staring at you from behind a two story Buddha. And what do you make of this? Uh, so, this is what you can make of it is the Buddha was one of the most restrained teachers of history. He saw so many of his teachers, Alara Kalama and Udaka Ramaputta, get stuck on various states they took as awakening. So the Buddha was very careful in articulating a cohesive, uh, self-contained kernel, an enormous kernel, but one that is very focused, a handful of leaves. And this is what he gave us because he knew it would last millennia. But what happens if you plant that kernel in a living culture, is it sprouts. This glowing heart of Budo is placed in soil and it grows into a shrine to Avilokiteshvara. It grows into the forms of uh, great disciples throughout history in the minds and hearts of a people of Thai. It grows into a three-story, seven-headed Naga. And when uh, uh, Ajahn Kovilo spoke yesterday and asked Long Por Nan about the mantra of Guan Yin. Um, what Long Por Nan said is that when we recollect this mantra, what we're doing is we're accentuating, we are looking to, we are remembering one facet of the Buddha's mind. 
embodied in a word, in an image, in a recollection, that of compassion. So here you come face to face with a culture that has spent two or thousands of years trying to articulate different aspects of the enlightened mind. And they've come up with a beautiful language to do it, but you have to understand it as such. So you can go over to the shrine next door and see Avilokiteshvara, the traditional bodhisattva of compassion. And you can wonder exactly where he fits into this whole pantheon of Theravada thought. But what it is, is it's the Buddha's compassion embodied in an image. You can understand that this Naga behind the Buddha is the aspect of the enlightened mind that is fierce, that is protective, that is powerful. And there's a place for that. Every aspect of this tradition has been a language developed over millennia to articulate in very careful terms, the heart of the teaching. So take it as such. The next recollection that the Buddha recommended to Mahanama was that of the Sangha. And in this, we have a special moment to understand that we spoke briefly about how the Buddha had seen his teachers get caught in these refined states and take them as the ultimate. And there's two roots to teaching truth in the Christian tradition. There's apophatic method, which is uh, teaching something by what it is not. Um, so you are not, uh, and, and then there's cataphatic, which is teaching truth or God in the Christian conception by what it is. And the Buddha, was so careful in apophatic method um, because he didn't, or because in that teaching, he doesn't give us much to grasp to and get deluded by. Instead, he says, just keep letting go. This is called the via negativa, the root of negation. You are not the khandas, you are not the body, you are not vedna, you are not perception, you are not mental formations, you are not consciousness. As to what you are, well, all things are not self, but practice and taste that flavor for yourself. And yet the issue with this is that you drop such a beautifully articulate and restrained teaching into a dry Western materialist worldview, and you get this intuition of nothing. If you let go of everything that you know, what are you left with? And this is the beauty of Sangha is that you encounter beings who have let go and they are not cold and they are not blank and they are not automatons. They are the warmest, most spontaneous, wise beings you have ever met. And the Buddha didn't need to articulate the ultimate uh, beyond the terms he did because he knew that when you encounter beings that embody Buddha, and Dhamma, you feel it in your body. That's our refuge. So this chance to come on pilgrimage or to tune in via Zoom, to meet teachers and practitioners who have embodied something very special is a chance to feel exactly where our refuge is. And we don't need to talk about it in too articulative terms. You know it. The other things to recollect is, the, uh, is one's morality. Um, and this is just good to keep in mind when you're on pilgrimage is there's going to be a lot of things coming up. So, so much of morality, restraint, often comes down to just holding still. Don't react, respond. And remember the monastic vinya requires, before we give admonition, five conditions are met. We have to ask permission and receive permission from the person we're admonishing. We have to say it at the right time. We have to have a mind of loving kindness. We have to speak truthfully. And in some of the lists, at least, we have to be free from fault ourselves. 
this is a very strong safeguard to make sure you are not simply venting your spleen at someone. And honestly, if you're with someone on pilgrimage for a few days, it's probably okay to let them have some quirks. Not that you can't address those things, but just to understand that it is really hard to be packed in a van with a bunch of people in a strange environment for a long time. Um, and this goes for everyone sitting here. It's hard to be in a monastery with a bunch of the same guys for a long time. Uh, I asked Long Propasno about living with other people once, and he said, living with other people, it's, it's terrible. <laughs> and then he cracked up because it's also the best thing. But then it goes for all of our home lives as well. So just to have restraint around that and recollect that one sila often might be in this case, just being okay to hold still for a time. You can say something if you need to, but it's okay to hold still. The next uh, recollection is one of dana giving. And just to remember that this is a chance to give, to care for all those around us as we move on this pilgrimage um, or in our lives. Uh, how can we make the people around us feel comfortable? How can we, in the words of uh, the Chula Gosinga Sutta, how can I not, how can I put aside what I want to do and instead do what these venerable ones want to do? Can you ask that and live by that for these days? And moreover, to recollect that in taking this pilgrimage, it is a gift to all those back home. One practitioner was telling me that when she told her boss in a work meeting um, and several others wh what she was taking off this time to do, um, and she was a little bit shy about talking about it, but finally she went out on a limb and did it. And um, one of the people afterwards said, you know, I've let go of my meditation practice and I think this is a sign I need to get back to it. I'm so inspired by what you're doing. And it's unexpected moments like that to take a strong step and take a few days out to come on retreat as those on Zoom are doing right now, or to go on a whole pilgrimage is truly a gift to those who see it. It is rare to have a landmark in one's life like that. And finally, recollection of the devas, the angels. You know, and uh, there was a period in my monastic life where I kept going to Long Pornan and I kept saying, you know, I'd, I'd really, really like to see a, a deva. That would be just great if that could be arranged or something. I don't know what sort of routes of communication are available here. And he said, look, something to the effect of, look, you see devas every day, which wasn't the answer I really wanted, but it was correct. Because what you're going to encounter here and this is the line the Buddha drew in the suttas as well. He said, one recollects the devas and says, whatever conviction were present in those angels, that is present in me. Whatever, uh, whatever morality ethics was present in those angels is present in me. Whatever generosity is present in those angels is present in me. Whatever uh, wisdom and whatever learning is present in those angels is present in me. He re reminds us that this body and this form are just that much. The heart is where the angel is. And you will meet so many special people on this pilgrimage. You already have met some of the sweetest monastics um, and they are, truly are devas. There are hidden gems here. And then to learn to see the angel in those around you, in your spouse in others in the house on this pilgrimage, there is an angel in each of us, along with a demon. It's there too. But look to the angel. So, when one recollects the Tathagata, one, one's mind heads straight based on that recollection. It is not overcome with greed, not overcome with hatred, not overcome by delusion. When one minds, one's mind heads straight, head straight, they gain a sense of the goal, a sense of the Dhamma, joy connected with the Dhamma. In one of joyful mind, rapture arises. The rapturous mind give rise to the tranquility of body. One of tranquil body becomes concentrated. Of one such as this, they say, 
of those who dwell among those who dwell out of tune, such a one dwells in tune. Of those who dwell with malice, such as one dwells without malice, having attained the stream of Dhamma, they recollect, they develop the recollection of the Tathagata. So walk pilgrimage well, whether you're at home, whether you're here, or whether you're about to take another van ride tomorrow. Good luck. <laughs>